brother hooked up with my fiance and got her pregnant just before our wedding. So I broke his face and kicked her out. Now my parents want me to forgive them, but I told them to F off and moved away. This is going to be a long one and it's as messed up as it sounds. I'll try to keep it as concise as possible, but there's a lot to unpack here. I don't care if anyone believes this or not, it's just so insane that I need to get it off my chest. Also, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything, but I'll avoid any details that could identify me to those who don't already know the situation. I'm a 32-year-old guy, and up until a few months ago, I was engaged to my girlfriend of five years, we'll call her Sarah. My younger brother, let's call him Mike, is 29 and has always been the golden child in our family. To really understand the depth of this betrayal and why it's hit me so hard, I need to give you some background on my family and how we got to this point. Growing up, Mike could do no wrong in our parents' eyes, while I was constantly criticized and punished for the smallest things. This wasn't just typical sibling rivalry or slight favoritism, it was blatant and extreme. Mike would break something, and I'd get blamed. He'd start a fight, and I'd be the one grounded. If we both got straight A's, he'd get a new video game console, while I'd get a pat on the back and be told to keep it up. Our parents, let's call them Tom and Linda, always had an excuse for their behavior. Mike's younger, he needs more attention. Or you're the older one, you should know better. Or Mike's just more sensitive, we have to be careful with him. It was a constant barrage of double standards and gaslighting that left me feeling worthless and unloved in my own home. As we got older, the favoritism only grew more pronounced. When I got into a good college on a partial scholarship, my parents barely acknowledged it. But when Mike decided to go to community college, they threw him a huge party and bought him a car to commute with. Never mind that I had been biking 5 miles each way to my part-time job for years. I moved out as soon as I could to escape the toxic environment at home. I put myself through college, working two jobs and taking out loans. Meanwhile, Mike dropped out after a semester, claiming college wasn't for him. Our parents supported his decision fully, praising him for knowing himself and not conforming to societal expectations. They even bankrolled his series of failed business ventures over the next few years. Despite the distance I tried to put between myself and my family, they always found a way to pull me back in. Holiday dinners were a nightmare of subtle jabs and not-so-subtle comparisons. Oh, you're still at that entry-level job. Well, Mike's thinking of starting another business. He's so entrepreneurial. Never mind that I was actually building a stable career while Mike was burning through our parents' retirement fund. I tried to maintain a relationship with Mike despite everything. He was still my brother, after all. But it was always one-sided. I'd reach out, try to connect, and he'd either ignore me or find some way to turn the conversation into a competition he could win. If I got a promotion, he'd suddenly have a big opportunity coming up. If I started dating someone, he'd miraculously be in a serious relationship too. It was during one of my attempts to reconnect with Mike that I met Sarah. She was a friend of one of his short-lived girlfriends, and we hit it off immediately. Sarah was everything I'd ever wanted in a partner, smart, funny, kind, and absolutely gorgeous. We started dating, and for the first time in my life, I felt truly happy and valued. My parents, predictably, were less than thrilled. They made snide comments about how Sarah was out of my league and questioned what she saw in me. Mike, on the other hand, suddenly became very interested in my life. He'd ask about Sarah constantly, wanting to know everything about her. At the time, I was just happy he seemed to care about something in my life. Looking back, I should have seen the red flags. Sarah and I moved in together after a year of dating, and things were great. We both had good jobs, we traveled, and we talked about the future. I started to feel like maybe, just maybe, I could have the life I always wanted, a successful career, a loving partner, and maybe even kids someday. I proposed to Sarah on our fourth anniversary. It wasn't anything flashy, just a quiet dinner at home and a heartfelt speech. She said yes, and I felt like I was on top of the world. We decided to have a long engagement, take our time planning the wedding. We were in no rush, we had our whole lives ahead of us, or so I thought. When we announced our engagement to my family, the reactions were mixed, to say the least. My mom plastered on a fake smile and said, oh, how nice, in a tone that suggested it was anything but. My dad grunted and said, good luck with that, before turning back to the TV. Mike, though, Mike's reaction was the strangest. He congratulated us, but there was something off about his smile, something almost predatory. I brushed it off at the time, chalking it up to my own insecurities. The next year was full of wedding planning and work stress. Sarah and I were both putting in long hours at our jobs, trying to save up for the wedding and a down payment on a house. We didn't see each other as much as we used to, but I figured it was just a phase. Every couple goes through rough patches, right? 
Looking back, I should have noticed the signs. Sarah became more distant, always on her phone, smiling at texts from someone she'd quickly say was just a friend from work. She started going out more with her girlfriends, coming home late smelling of alcohol and cologne. But I trusted her completely, I never even considered that she might be cheating, let alone with my own brother. About four months ago, Sarah started acting even stranger. She was moody, irritable, and constantly nauseous. I thought maybe she was pregnant, and I was thrilled at the idea. We hadn't been trying, but we talked about wanting kids eventually. I started planning how I'd support her, imagining nursery colors and baby names. Then one night, she sat me down with tears in her eyes and dropped the bomb. She was pregnant, but it wasn't mine. I was stunned. We hadn't been intimate in a while due to our busy schedules, but I never imagined she'd cheat on me. When I asked who the father was, she broke down completely and whispered, It's Mike. In that moment, my entire world shattered. Everything I thought I knew, everything I had built my life around, came crashing down. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't think, all I could feel was this overwhelming sense of betrayal and loss. Sarah tried to explain, her words coming out in a rush between sobs. Apparently, it had started at our engagement party. Mike had cornered her, told her she was making a mistake marrying me. He played on her insecurities, telling her she could do better, that he could give her everything I couldn't. It wasn't just a one-time thing, they'd been having an affair for months. I kicked Sarah out that night. I couldn't stand to look at her, couldn't bear to be in the same room as the woman who had betrayed me so completely. She begged me to forgive her, said it was a mistake and that she loved me. But all I could think about was how many times she'd lied to my face, how many times she'd been with my brother while wearing the ring I'd given her. After Sarah left, I called Mike. I don't even remember what I said. It was all a blur of rage and pain. He tried to play it cool at first, saying it was just a drunk mistake and that it didn't mean anything. But when I pressed him, he got defensive and said, well, maybe if you'd been a better fiancé, she wouldn't have come to me. I saw red. I got in my car and drove to his apartment, ready to do something that would make him regret what he said. I don't know what I was planning to do, but when I got there, our parents were already there. Apparently, Mike had called them first, spinning some story about how Sarah had seduced him and how sorry he was. And you know what? They believed him. They always do. My mom immediately started lecturing me about forgiveness and family, while my dad just stood there with his arms crossed, looking disappointed in me. Of course, not in his precious Mike. I tried to explain what really happened, but they wouldn't listen. They kept insisting that I needed to forgive Mike and support Sarah through the pregnancy because family comes first. I lost it. Years of pent-up resentment and anger came pouring out. I told them exactly what I thought of their twisted sense of loyalty. How they'd always favored Mike at my expense. How they'd never once taken my side or supported me. I told Mike he was dead to me, that he was no longer my brother. I told my parents they could have the son they'd always wanted because they no longer had me. I stormed out, ignoring their shouts and pleas. I drove for hours, no destination in mind, just needing to be away from everything and everyone. When I finally went home, I had dozens of missed calls and messages. Some were from Sarah begging for another chance, some from Mike alternating between apologies and accusations, but most were from my parents demanding that I grow up and make amends. I ignored them all, barely eating, barely sleeping. I called out of work, using all my saved up vacation days. I couldn't face anyone, couldn't bear the thought of having to explain what had happened. I just sat in my apartment, replaying every moment of my relationship with Sarah, every interaction with Mike, trying to see where I'd gone wrong. It's been three months now. I've moved to a new apartment, changed my number, and started therapy to deal with all this mess. But my family won't let up. Despite my efforts to cut contact, they keep finding ways to intrude on my life. They've started showing up at my workplace, trying to ambush me and force a reconciliation. My mom corners me in the parking lot, crying about how I'm tearing the family apart. My dad leaves gruff voicemails about how I need to man up and forgive Mike. Mike himself has tried to approach me a few times, but I've managed to avoid him so far. They've even sent flying monkeys in the form of extended family members to guilt trip me into forgiving Mike. Aunts, uncles, cousins I haven't spoken to in years are suddenly blowing up my phone, telling me how important family is and how I need to let bygones be bygones. It's like they're living in some alternate reality where what Mike and Sarah did is just a small mistake, not a life-changing one. The latest development, I got a message from Sarah yesterday. She's keeping the baby and wants to co-parent with Mike. And guess what? My parents are over the moon about becoming grandparents, completely ignoring the circumstances of how it happened and the snide remarks they used to make when Sarah was with me. 
The letter was full of apologies and explanations, talking about how she and Mike had found real love through this difficult situation. She even had the audacity to say she hoped we could all be friends someday for the sake of the child. I'm at my wit's end. Part of me wants to just cut ties completely and start fresh somewhere else, maybe move to another state, change my name, build a new life where no one knows about this mess. But another part of me is so angry that I want to stay and fight to make them see how messed up this whole situation is. I don't know what to do anymore. The betrayal has affected every aspect of my life. I can't stand to be alone with my thoughts. I haven't even considered dating again. The thought of trusting someone like that terrifies me. I've lost friends over this too. People who think I should take the high road and reconcile with my family. As if I'm the one in the wrong for not wanting to play happy families with the people who hurt me the most. The thought of Sarah and Mike raising a child together, a child that should have been mine, is like a constant knife in my gut. I know logically that the child is innocent in all this, it's not the baby's fault that its parents are lying, cheating scumbags, but I can't bring myself to have any positive feelings about its existence. My parents have started talking about how I need to be involved in the child's life, how I'm going to be an uncle. The thought makes me physically ill. How am I supposed to look at this kid and not see the ultimate symbol of my brother's betrayal? So, Reddit, I guess what I'm asking is, am I the idiot for refusing to forgive my brother and ex-fiancé? Am I wrong for wanting to cut ties with my family over this? Any advice on how to move forward would be appreciated because, right now, I feel like I'm drowning in a sea of betrayal and gaslighting. I know this was long, and if you've read this far, thank you. Just writing all this out has been cathartic in a way. I don't know what I expect to gain from posting this, validation, maybe advice, or maybe just the chance to scream into the void and have someone, anyone, hear me. Edit, holy crap, this blew up overnight. Thank you all for the support and advice. I'm overwhelmed by the response, and it's going to take me some time to read through all the comments. However, I wanted to address some common questions. 1. Yes, I've spoken to a lawyer about a restraining order against my family, it's in progress. 2. No, I'm not planning on having any contact with the baby. It's not the kid's fault, but I can't be involved without losing my sanity. 3. For those asking about my job, I've already spoken to HR about the situation. They're aware and supportive. They've increased security at the front desk and given me the option to work from home more often. I'm grateful for their understanding. 4. Many of you have asked if I've considered moving to another city or state. It's definitely something I'm thinking about. My company has offices in several other cities, so a transfer might be possible. I'm weighing the pros and cons. 5. To those suggesting DNA tests, Sarah admitted the affair, and the timeline matches up. I have no reason to believe the child isn't Mike's. Even if, by some miracle, it turned out to be mine, I'm not sure I could ever look at that child without thinking of this. 6. I've been overwhelmed by the number of people sharing similar stories. It's heartbreaking to know how common this kind of betrayal is, but it's also oddly comforting to know I'm not alone. Thank you all for your vulnerability and sharing. 7. To the person who asked if I've considered legal action against Mike for alienation of affection. I looked into it but, unfortunately, it's not recognized in my state. Even if it were, I'm not sure I have the energy for a legal battle right now. 8. Several people have pointed out that Mike's behavior sounds narcissistic. I've started reading about narcissistic personality disorder, and a lot of it rings true. It's helping me understand, though not excuse, some of his actions. 9. For those asking about Sarah's family, they're as shocked and disgusted as you'd expect. They've cut contact with her and have reached out to offer their support to me. It's a small comfort, but I appreciate it. 10. To the person who asked if I've thought about having kids of my own someday. Honestly, this whole experience has made me question whether I want to have a family at all. But I'm trying not to make any big decisions while I'm still processing everything. I'll update if anything significant happens, but for now, I'm focusing on healing and moving forward. Thanks again, Reddit. You've helped more than you know. Your support and advice have given me a lot to think about and have honestly been a lifeline during this difficult time. I may not be able to respond to every comment, but please know I'm reading them all, and they're helping me feel less alone in this. Update. Hey Reddit, it's been about two weeks since my last post, and it's been a complete roller coaster. First off, thank you all for the overwhelming support and advice. I never expected my post to blow up like that, and reading through all your comments has been both heartbreaking and oddly comforting. It's messed up how common this kind of betrayal is. The past couple of weeks have been intense, to say the least. Remember how I mentioned I was working on getting a restraining order? Well, that turned into a whole ordeal. 
my lawyer submitted the paperwork, and we had a hearing scheduled. I thought it would be straightforward, given the evidence and the constant harassment, but I was wrong. My parents showed up to the hearing with their own lawyer, some fancy guy in an expensive suit who probably charges more per hour than I make in a week. They tried to paint me as the unstable one, claiming I was tearing the family apart over a simple misunderstanding, as if Mike accidentally tripped and fell into my fiancé. The judge, thankfully, wasn't buying it. She granted the restraining order against Mike and my parents, but not without my mother bursting into tears in the courtroom and my father glaring at me like I had just committed slaughter. The look on Mike's face, though, I swear, if looks could slaughter, I'd be six feet under. As we were leaving the courthouse, Mike tried to approach me. My lawyer stepped between us, reminding him of the newly instated restraining order. Mike just sneered and said this wasn't over, that I couldn't hide behind a piece of paper forever. I'd be lying if I said his words didn't shake me a bit, but for now, at least, I have some legal protection. The workplace situation has been another nightmare. Remember how I mentioned my family had been showing up at my workplace? Well, that came to a head last week. I was in a meeting with a client when my assistant buzzed in, saying my mother was in the lobby and causing a scene. Apparently, she brought a photo album and was trying to show my co-workers baby pictures of Mike and me, all while sobbing about how her boys used to be so close. I excused myself from the meeting and went down to the lobby, where I found my mom surrounded by a group of uncomfortable-looking co-workers. She was in the middle of telling a story about how Mike and I used to take baths together as toddlers when she saw me. She tried to rush towards me, talking about a baby shower, but I cut her off. I told her she needed to leave immediately or I'd call the police and have her removed for trespassing and violating the restraining order. The look on her face was like I'd slapped her, but after everything they've put me through, I couldn't bring myself to care. Security escorted her out, and I had to spend the next hour doing damage control with my boss and co-workers. Thankfully, most of them were understanding, but I could tell some were wondering what kind of drama I was bringing into the workplace. The confrontation with Mike, though, that's where things really went off the rails. Last Saturday, I was at the gym trying to work out some of my anger on the punching bag. I was so focused on my workout that I didn't notice someone come up behind me until I heard his voice. I spun around and there was Mike, smirking at me like he hadn't just violated the restraining order. He started running his mouth loud enough for nearby people to hear. I told him to get out before I called the cops, but he just laughed, saying he'd tell them how I'd been threatening him and Sarah. That's when I lost it. I swung at him, my fist connecting with his jaw. He stumbled back before lunging at me. We ended up on the floor, trading blows like we were kids again, except this time there were no parents to break us up, no one telling me to be the bigger person and let Mike win. I got in a few good hits before the gym staff pulled us apart. Mike's nose was bleeding, and I could feel mine swelling shut. We were both yelling, trying to break free and get at each other again. The gym manager threatened to call the cops, and that finally snapped me out of it. I grabbed my stuff and left. As I was driving home, still shaking with adrenaline, I got a call from an unknown number. Against my better judgment, I answered it. It was Sarah, screaming at me about how I had broken Mike's nose and he might need surgery. I laughed. I couldn't help it. The absurdity of her being angry at me after everything they'd done was just too much. I told her I was sorry if I hurt her little boyfriend, the one she'd been sleeping with behind my back for months. She started sobbing, then going on about how stressed she was and how the baby could sense her distress, and how could I be so selfish? I hung up on her and blocked the number. The fallout from the fight was intense. News had spread like wildfire through our social circle. My phone was blowing up with texts from friends and family members, some taking my side, others calling me names for hitting my poor defenseless brother. Sarah's parents reached out again, reiterating their support for me and expressing their disappointment in their daughter. It was a small comfort, but at this point, I'll take what I can get. The restraining order doesn't feel like enough anymore. Mike's shown he's willing to violate it, and I'm worried about what he might do next. The legal aftermath has been a nightmare. The day after the gym incident, I got a call from my lawyer. Apparently, Mike had filed assault charges against me. I explained what had happened, how Mike had violated the restraining order, how he'd provoked me. My lawyer sighed and said we'd fight it, but it might be an uphill battle given that I threw the first punch. We're in the process of filing our own charges against Mike for violating the restraining order. My lawyer seems confident that this will help our case, but nothing's certain. I've had to give statements to the police, show them the bruises on my face and knuckles. It's humiliating having to justify defending myself against my own brother. The gym has banned both Mike and me for life. I can't say I blame them, but it sucks that the gym was one of the few places I felt like I could let out some of my anger in a healthy way. 
My cousin Amy, who I've always been close to, called me the other day. She's been catching a lot of heat from the family for supporting me, but she's standing firm. She told me some of what's been going on behind the scenes. Apparently, my parents have been telling everyone that I'm having some kind of mental breakdown. They're saying that Sarah and Mike's relationship only started after Sarah and I had broken up and that I'm just jealous and can't let go. Amy says a lot of the family isn't buying it, but some are. It's infuriating knowing that they're out there spreading lies about me while I'm trying to keep my head down and heal. Things at work have been, to say the least, challenging. After the incident with my mom in the lobby and the fight with Mike making the rounds on local social media, I can tell my co-workers are walking on eggshells around me. My boss called me into his office earlier this week. He started by saying he values me as an employee and understands I'm going through a difficult time. But then he hit me with the kicker, he thinks it might be best if I take a leave of absence until things settle down. He said we could call it a personal sabbatical if I'd like, paid of course. I wanted to argue, to tell him that work is the only thing keeping me sane right now. But I could see the decision had already been made. So, I agreed, thanked him for his understanding and started packing up my office. As I was leaving, I overheard two of my co-workers whispering about how my brother had gotten my fiancé pregnant. I slammed my office door louder than necessary as I left, taking some small satisfaction in seeing them jump. I'd be lying if I said all of this wasn't affecting me. I've started going on long drives at night just to get out of my apartment. Sometimes, I find myself parked outside my old place, the one I shared with Sarah, wondering how the hell my life turned into such a mess. In all of this chaos, I found support from an unexpected source, Sarah's younger sister, Emma. Emma reached out to me through social media, apologizing for her sister's actions and offering her support. At first, I was wary, what if this was some kind of trick? But after talking with her, I realized she's just as disgusted by Sarah's behavior as I am. She's been feeding me information about what's going on in Sarah and Mike's world. Apparently, they've moved in together, playing house as if they didn't just blow up multiple lives to be together. Emma says Sarah's been trying to paint herself as the victim, crying to anyone who will listen about how she never meant to hurt anyone and how she and Mike are soulmates who found each other against all odds. It makes me sick to my stomach, but I'm grateful to Emma for keeping me in the loop. Knowledge is power, after all, even if it's knowledge I'd rather not have. The social media situation has been another nightmare. I've always been a pretty private person, but this whole situation has thrust me into an unwanted spotlight. Someone, I suspect one of Mike's friends, posted about our gym feud on a local Facebook group. The post didn't use our names, but it described the situation in enough detail that anyone who knows us could figure it out. The comments section turned into a battleground. Some people were defending me, saying Mike got what he deserved. Others were calling me unstable and saying I need to be locked up. I made the mistake of reading through some of the comments one night after a few too many beers, a big mistake. I ended up throwing my phone across the room hard enough to crack the screen. I've since deactivated most of my social media accounts. I can't deal with the constant notifications and messages from people I haven't talked to in years, suddenly wanting to know all the juicy details of my personal life. With everything that's happened, I've realized I can't stay in this city anymore. There are too many memories, too many chances of running into Sarah, Mike, or my parents. I've started looking into transfers within my company. There's an opening in our Seattle office that looks promising. It's not ideal, I've never been a fan of constant rain. But at this point, I'd move to the moon if it meant getting away from all this drama. I haven't made any final decisions yet, but the idea of a fresh start is becoming more and more appealing. New city, new apartment, new life, a place where no one knows me as the guy whose brother knocked up his fiance. My parents have been suspiciously quiet since the restraining order was granted. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, for them to find some new way to try and force their way back into my life. Sarah's been spreading the news about her pregnancy far and wide. Emma tells me she's been posting constant updates on social media, ultrasound pictures, belly shots, the works, always with a caption about how blessed she and Mike are and how excited they are to start their family. Each new piece of information feels like a fresh wound reopening, the hurt just when I think I'm starting to heal. So, that's where things stand now. Two weeks ago, I thought my life couldn't get any more messed up, but somehow it has. I'm still angry, I'm still hurt, but I'm also tired, tired of defending myself. So, Reddit, I guess this is less of an update and more of a, I don't know, a cry into the void. I'm not even sure what I'm asking for at this point, advice, sympathy, a time machine so I can go back and never introduce Sarah to my brother. Whatever happens next, I'll try to keep you all updated. Your support has meant more to me than you can know.
It's good to be reminded that there are still good people out there, even when it feels like my whole world is full of betrayal and lies. Final update. Hey Reddit, it's been a week since my last update, and I'm back with what I hope will be my final post on this whole mess. First off, I want to thank everyone for their support and advice throughout this ordeal. Your words have been a lifeline during the darkest moments of my life. So, where to begin? A lot has happened in just seven days, and I'm still trying to process it all. I guess I'll start with the biggest news, I'm moving. Yeah, that's right, I took the plunge and accepted a transfer to our Seattle office. It wasn't an easy decision, but after everything that's gone down, I knew I needed a fresh start. The decision came after a particularly rough day last week. I had just gotten back from another meeting with my lawyer about Mike's assault charges when I found a letter in my mailbox. It was from Sarah. I almost threw it away without opening it, but curiosity got the better of me. Inside was an ultrasound picture and a handwritten note talking about how excited she and Mike were about their baby. She went on about how she hoped I could find it in my heart to be happy for them and how the baby would love to have its uncle in its life. I saw red. Before I knew what I was doing, I had grabbed my phone, unblocked Sarah, and dialed her number. She picked up on the second ring, and I just let loose. I told her exactly what I thought of her, Mike, and their happy little family. I told her she was delusional if she thought I'd ever want anything to do with that kid and that as far as I was concerned, she, Mike, and the baby could all go to hell. It wasn't my finest moment, but I felt like I'd finally said all the things I'd been holding back. That's when I knew I couldn't stay in this city anymore. I called my boss that same night and told him I wanted to take the transfer to Seattle. He seemed relieved. To be honest, I think he was worried about how all this drama might affect the company. He promised to fast track the paperwork, and by the next morning, it was official. I had two weeks to pack up my life and move across the country. The news of my move spread quickly through my family and social circle. My parents, predictably, were furious. They showed up at my apartment unannounced, again violating the restraining order to try and talk me out of it. My mom was crying, saying I was abandoning the family, while my dad was red-faced and yelling about how I was being selfish and immature. I didn't engage. I just called the police and had them removed for violating the restraining order. As they were being escorted out, my mom shouted that I would regret this, that family was everything, and I was throwing it all away. I just closed the door and went back to packing. Mike's reaction was different. He didn't try to contact me directly, probably because of the pending legal issues, but he put up a long post on social media about how some people can't handle seeing others happy and how he and Sarah were rising above the hate to focus on their new family. It was clearly aimed at me, trying to paint himself as the victim. I'll admit it stung to see how many people liked and commented in support of him, but I reminded myself that their opinion doesn't matter. They don't know the truth. Sarah's reaction was the most surprising. After our phone call, she reached out to her sister Emma, who, if you remember, had been keeping me in the loop about what was going on with Sarah and Mike. Apparently, my words had hit home harder than I expected. Emma told me that Sarah had broken down, admitting that she knew what she and Mike had done was wrong and that she was terrified of the future. My cousin Amy, bless her, offered to help me pack. She even told me more about what's been happening with the family. Amy told me that my aunt, my mom's sister, had a big blow up with my mom, calling her out for always favoring Mike and pushing me away. It got pretty ugly, with my aunt saying that my mom and dad were reaping what they'd sown with their years of favoritism. I can't say I'm not a little satisfied to hear that someone is finally calling them out on their behavior. The legal situation is still ongoing, but my lawyer assures me that my move won't affect anything. We're still pressing charges against Mike for violating the restraining order and fighting the assault charges he filed against me. My lawyer seems confident that the judge will see through Mike's claims, especially given his history of violating the restraining order. The fact that I'm moving across the country should also help demonstrate that I'm not a threat to Mike, which might help get his charges dismissed. I'm not sure if I'll post any more updates after this. Part of starting fresh means leaving the past behind, and as helpful as this community has been, I think it's time for me to step away from rehashing this story. I need to focus on building my new life, not dwelling on the old one. So, I guess this is it, my final update. Wish me luck, Reddit. I've got a whole new life waiting for me in Seattle, and I intend to make the most of it. Thank you so much for watching till the end. If you really like our videos, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Have a good day.